Um, what we are going to do now, um, Gonzalo, is that we are going to invite um, Fatiha Ayat to make a statement because she has been waiting for a long time. She's just eight years old. <laughs> so, and can I invite her? Then I'll open it up for questions and answers and David will facilitate that bit. Okay, can I now invite Fatiha? You are there waiting uh, to say something. This is your chance. Hello. Hello. Hmm. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Fatiha Ayat. I am a nine year old child rights and You're climate right. activist. Yeah. Okay. You wanted to say anything? No, no, I said you're nine years, I said eight year old. <laughs> it's okay, yeah. It is an immense pleasure and I am really proud as I got the opportunity to talk here in this prestigious program. But the issues and topics and points I'm going to talk about today, it's not an immense pleasure and it doesn't make me proud at the same time. Today we are here to talk about global warming, the carbon footprint of plastics, ocean acidification, and its effects on marine biodiversity and coral reefs. And this is the problems. Our top world leaders are talking only. No major and practical in initiatives are being taken. It's like they are meeting our extreme hunger by supplying us the paper recipe, not the food itself. Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, or IPCC, report is clearly pointing out the threat. And looking at that, with a pair of disappointed glance, the political leaders are fulfilling their duties by exhaling sigh of dissatisfaction. But things should not be like this. This is the high time for us to act, not only to check. We have taken the ocean for granted. We are acting as though its resources are infinite, as if its system is unchallengeable. Now, the ocean is starting to falter. Its water is heating and acidifying. Its coral is bleaching. Its islands are drowning. Its fish stocks are in decline. And yet, we have no clearly visible and tangible actions. We must help the ocean to heal. We hear a lot about sea level rising, but that is no more just a theory. It became practical. If you really want to understand what is at stake at the Paris Climate Talks, then my country Bangladesh pretty much says it all. There are more people in Bangladesh at direct risk from sea level rise and extreme weather events than anywhere else on the planet. We all need a next we all need a deal at the next climate conference in Glasgow, and no other nation needs it more than my country Bangladesh does. By the end of the century, the this entire country will be permanently underwater. Sea level is rising here 2.3 meters per one degree temperature rise. And as for one meter rise of sea level, 30 million people are losing their homes in the coastal regions of Bangladesh. Salinity is increasing. Deforestation is happening in the Shundarban. And without the Shundarban as a shield for Bangladesh, Bangladesh is having even more tropical cyclones. People of this area collect their drinking water from, uh, from the under the ground by Chiu well. But that underground Chiu well water is also becoming saline. This also means that rice crops cannot survive. The developed nations, the highest carbon emitting countries are the ones that have to take full responsibility of Bangladesh. The coastal region of Bangladesh has 30 million people living in this world's second largest river delta region. This area is vulnerable to the effects of climate change. This low-lying land is facing sea level rise that is three times more than the global average. Several islands of this delta have already disappeared. Flooding, unpredictable rainfall, and an increasingly severe tropical cyclones have left maximum agriculture land of this region barren. People are losing their home and becoming climate refugees. A good topic on the table of discussion for our world leaders while they are sipping into the bottle of mineral water. I demand our world leaders to stop playing this dirty card of politics and to act immediately in favor of these vulnerable people. Because the extreme conditions and bitter experience that the people of Bangladesh are facing today due to the climate crisis will soon affect us all. Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, or IPCC report, clearly says oceans in this region is warming and glaciers from the Himalayas are melting much more quicker than ever before. People here are facing greater amounts and intensities of rainfall during the monsoon, which have increased the magnitude of flood. Things are accelerating much more rapidly. And finally, than it was initially expected, because of the natural movement of water and sediment, the rivers are filling with silt. 
We should turn away from dirty fools towards the abundant renewable energy that nature bestows. We must also protect the ocean's ability to store carbon dioxide. We can do this by nurturing the rainforest of the ocean. To protect, by taking care of the habitats that capture carbon. And also, we should help to protect the coastal communities. We should preserve the foundation of the ocean's food webs, the organisms, to help transport carbon into the deep sea. Believe me, the ocean can use its enormous power to clean and regenerate itself, only if we give it a chance by fishing sustainably and creating protected zones where life can flourish and adapt to the challenging climate and by using science to continue unraveling the ocean secrets. Because if we truly understand and respect it, the ocean will help us safeguard all life on earth. So in conclusion, I would like to say that I demand the world leaders to stop talking and to start acting. Because if they, don't do, if they do not act now, then the bitter experiences that the people of Bangladesh are facing today will soon affect us all. I know that the world leaders may be working, but that is just not hard enough. Thank you for letting me deliver this speech today. Thank you and assalamu alaikum. Thank you very much. Absolutely extraordinary. Um, what do wow. you want, we want that too. My goodness. Any wow. comment on her? <laughs> <laughs> what do you want, Fatiha? All of us want that as well. So thank you so much for giving this speech. And thank you for letting me talk here. And we'll be in touch again. And if you have to, if you have to do any homework, you, you can go and do it. Or if you want to stay with us, you're very welcome. And the question and answer session will start very soon. There will be, David, I'm going to really look at you now to facilitate that section. There will be two short interventions there. One is from Dr. Diana Pritchard from the University of Bedfordshire. Uh, and there are some questions already have been asked, but I'm sure our uh, audience here will put more questions to you. There is another one. There will be a short intervention from uh, Emily Malkin. Um, she's actually working uh, with uh, a private member's bill in this country on climate crisis, uh, and I'm sure she will have something to say as well. And when you will invite her, I'm sure she will explain what it is all about. So it's the floor is yours, David. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. That was the, those that presentation and the intervention from Fatiha were both very very interesting and the presentation was quite chilling uh, i think that uh, the issues raised by uh, fatiha i'm sure that we're going to come back to those because the whole question is uh, what to do about it now what we're going to do we're going to run through the questions and answers i've spotted some questions in the, uh, in the chat chat area so what i'll do is i'll run through i'll ask people to um to, I'll call out people's names and ask them to make a question. If I call your name, I apologise if I mispronounce it. There are people from many parts of the world here. Uh, and also, if people can remember to unmute their, um, their microphone when, when, I, when I call them, because uh, it, there's nothing more frustrating than making some very incisive observation and then finding that nobody's heard a word of it because your microphone's been muted. Um, there have been some questions, I think we'll start off, there have been some questions that relate directly back to Gonzalo's uh, talk, which I think it would be quite useful to, um, to, to follow up. And there was two that actually struck me, uh, Clarissa Bushell, um, you had a question about the areas that should be targeted for rewilding. Yes, uh, thank you very much. I was just listening to Gonzalo and he was talking about rewilding the oceans and I was thinking what a, how, how difficult that must be and how, our decision, how would decisions be made as to which areas of the oceans worldwide um, could be used for this particular process. Um. It's it's actually it's it's already starting um, in in parts of the um, the Great Barrier Reef in Australia, for example, in Caribbean. Um, there is rewilding of coral reefs. What they do, they are um, taking part, um, you know um, pieces, shall we put it that way, of of the colony and transplanting them into another sort of 
geographical location where the conditions are better, in other words, less affected by ocean acidification, and, and then, then that the, you know, the scientists, marine biologists know that those conditions are going to uh, be the right ones. So it is happening, that's one example, it's already happening. Um, in the, here in the coast of Sussex, for example, um, we've got a new project which is called the uh, Help Our Kelp for you know, and, and, and kelp forests here off the coast, they're, they're natural, um, you know, ecos, underwater ecosystems. So now the, um, for example, the Sussex Wildlife Trust have formed a partnership with the uh, Marine Conservation Society, the Blue Marine Foundation and the local uh, authorities to try to recover the, um, the kelp forests um, and creating more protected areas around that. And the reason it's important, for example, it's because we know that when kelp forests flourish, they, again, they are underwater forests and they're going to attract animals, and, you know, marine animals. They're going to attract biodiversity. They're going to form, uh, you know, um, symbiotic relationships. And that is what we want at the end of the day. It's to recreate the natural ecosystems, in this case, underwater. So it's not impossible. It is happening. And I, I hope that it's going to happen more and more. Um, and um, I think we should aim at least, at least for 30% of the global oceans as marine protected, protected, absolutely protected areas, like, you know, the natural reserves that we've got on land. So that, that so, is happening. So presumably, I mean, even if you protected the coastline of every country in the world, that wouldn't even make up 30%, would it? Um, I, I, I don't know what, what the, okay. you know if, if that is thirty percent or not, but but uh, that is the um, that is the, the the estimate in order to keep to keep having healthy oceans. We have to remember that at the end of the day, we cannot separate land from underwater. It's all an integrated integrated system, and if we, if we don't recover healthy oceans, we won't recover healthy atmosphere. It's as simple as that. Everything is integrated, and and. And the opposite is it's it's true. If we don't recover the atmosphere, we won't recover the the oceans, because everything is linked, and and they are the drivers of the global climate at the end of the day. Thank you. Uh, there's also a question that Samita Singh uh, raised, which I think is actually quite similar, uh, in the same in the same vein about waste management in marine areas. Samita, would you like to speak? Hello, Gonzalves. This is Smita. Smita, yes, yes. Uh -huh. I would uh -huh. like to ask uh, if uh, what are the measures or should a citizen should take for the uh, management things? If you are going for the conservation of the oceans and all, so what is a citizen, as a citizen, what we can do for the waste yeah. management? And uh, uh, First thing, first is my first question, and second is, what are the management? What are the uh, what the UN UN is taking steps for that? Yeah. Um, I want to yeah. if, if any schemes are there, any measures are there, if any programs are going on by which we can take part in that kind of uh, activities or program. So I want yeah. to know about that. Yeah. Thank, Thank you, Smita. Uh, that, your question is very very important. The crucial the crucial thing the crucial um, question that we have to always keep in mind that what we want, the crucial goal, is that we need to decarbonize human activity. We need to decarbonize our lifestyles. So whatever way that we can think of, of decarbonizing our personal lifestyle, that is something that is going to contribute, in other words, to the global, to the global problem. Yes, we do have a global problem, um, and I'm going to address that in a minute. But at personal level, everything we can do, cycle more rather than use a car, for example, um, anything that we can think of, use less plastics. We have seen plastics, the origin of plastic is fossil fuel, you know. Um, and, and there are other things that, that, that um, we can do, for example, in terms of our um, campaigning for our local local councils, for example, to sometimes they, they put investments in, um, in funds that actually are going to subsidize petrochemicals or, or 
um, you know, the fossil fuel industry. And we should be campaigning at local level for our councils to move away their money, in other words, to invest them in, in green and renewable energy. So those are the kind of things. But at a personal level, that's one thing. Um, on the other hand, in terms of global governance, we need to go back. I think there was something you mentioned about that, what the United Nations um, um, w w was doing. You mentioned, I think that was part of your question. What, uh, what, do you, what do you say? Sorry, uh, did you mention something about the United Nations? Uh, I just want to know what are the uh, programs are conducted by the United Nations at the country level, if the, any program is going on for the nation, cons this conservation program, uh -huh. for the yes. ocean conservation programs, any program is going on so that we scholars can participate in that, be as yeah. a scholar. Yeah, yeah. Yes, I, 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 I wouldn't be able to answer, you know, specifically about the, pro, the programs, but over the big pictures, yes, the United Nations, through one of its agencies, which is the, um, the UN Environment Program, and you can, uh, you can Google it, you will find the website, um, is running or sponsoring um, programs worldwide. Um, either through other um, partnerships or programs on, on their own. So yes, the, the United Nations is very much on board. We have to remember that it's, it's thanks to the United Nations that we have, we had, for example, you know, years ago, the Kyoto Protocol uh, on the environment. It's thanks to the United Nations that in 2015, we had the Paris Agreement. You know, it's thanks to the United Nations that we had you know, the coordination of the IPCC report. It's thanks to the United Nations that we've got the, um, you know, the annual conferences, COP26 Co -op this year, for example. So the, the United Nations is taking as priority the global, the global climate. <coughs> Why is that? Because it's going to affect everyone in the world. So, so yes, there are some programs, but, uh, you, you know, I will encourage you to look for the specific projects in, um, on those websites. Thank you so much for your information yeah. and everything. And about the COP25, our representative of our country is very looking, very keen in working in that direction, Mr. Prakash Javedkar, sir. So thank you so much for the, all the information you gave us. No, thank you. Ple pleasure. It's wonderful to have you with us. Thank you. Thank you. Just, just keeping on the question of waste, there, there was an interesting question. I'm going to, I'm going to pronounce uh, the this person's name wrong, Lara Harp-Paug, is it, who asked a question about whether plastic can be made from cellulose. And Lara, are you, are you here? Yeah, I am. I just wondered, um, with our increase in pro um, plastic production, whether that was taking into account new plastic production methods or whether it was still based, still taking into account only those based on oil. Thank you, Lara. Um, yes, I mean, that, that particular... Um, the, what, the, what I shared was the, um, a particular report made by this, uh, um, this environmental, very well-respected environmental um, European, um, um, you know, um, organization that they uh, released this last year, this report. Um, and that particular one was um, just taking into consideration the production of plastics from fossil fuels. Of course, at the end of the day, you're right. We need to, and that, again, it's, it's with our personal behavior as, as consumers, or, you know, if I can put it that way, um, or, or creating the demand, we need to move away from plastic to another type. Uh, in fact, I mean, it would be ideal if we could provide our own um, containers. I mean, you know, uh, you know, um, I don't know how to how to put it, but yes, we we could we, we should move to definitely natural natural um, you know products. You know that that that's definitely why is that? Because what we are doing at the end, we want hopefully to use the natural systems as much as we can. To in other words, to copy nature with our with our behavior in our lifestyles. That is a concept. The concept here is to copy nature in our lifestyles. Thank you. I was just hoping that that was slightly more positive information than it actually was, but thank you. Yeah, okay.
It's Thank actually you. been a, a question fo following that up almost from Roy and Becky Franken about the use of hemp. Oh, oh. hi, yes, sorry. Um, we we um, went to a, a webinar last year that was held in Lewis and uh, it was just amazing to see how hemp could be made. It had so many uses from building materials to textiles to containers but also that that actually growing hemp you know could could actually help with um, carbon capture so there was a kind of win-win potential for hemp but I understand that growing is restricted um, by law which seems you know like like we're missing a huge trick so I, I just wonder whether there is potential there to uh, to, to, to really lobby for greater use of hemp to replace plastic. Um, thank you, Becky. Um, yes, what, what I would say, I don't know the specifics about that particular example, but I think that it's a, it's a very good example according to what you are, you're saying, you know. Um, and yes, again, hemp, obviously, it's a natural product. Um, and if, if we can find ways of using it to replace actual plastics which is our own make as our own mess you know um the better so um so yes i i i i, I personally need to learn more about that um, that particular product you know product that sounds very interesting yeah, I agree. I, I, it, it seems to me that if we're going to resolve the problem of plastic then somehow or other the requirement for what plastic does is going to remain and we have to we have to find some other way of producing something that is as equally convenient we're not going to be able to stop it yes okay. yes the, the, the thing with with plastic the, the, the production of plastic is it's relatively cheap mm. you know you go to the supermarkets today and all the fruit and vegetables boom in a, in a container with plastic because yes. it's cheap you know and that's the tragedy of that the tragedy is and it's and it's you know a single use so we, we need to move away from that um, as, you know, from, from that behavior as much as we can. Just thinking about, about behavior, we have uh, Anya Kennedy is here, who, who is 16 and she's studying her, her A-levels in, in, in England. And she has a, a question about um, what, we, what we can actually do. An Anya, are you here? Hi, yeah, I was just wondering how we could make it more accessible for everybody because from what I've seen it's quite like an expensive thing to be eco-friendly, unfortunately. That, that's very true, Ania, that, and that's precisely the problem. And that is exactly what, I, in th those graphics that I showed, that's exactly what the petrochemicals have spotted. They see it as a business opportunity, as profit, because they know that mostly developed countries the better off shall we put in the, in, the, in in worldwide can afford those alternatives poorer countries poorer communities they are going they know that they are going to increase their plastic consumption and the petrochemicals are saying we are here we're going to produce more because you will use them and and, and that is a crucial question you're right my my idea would be, for example, to find a way through uh, the governments and, 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 for, um, and uh, so an agreement through the, the United Nations, which pr 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 uh, you know, provides a, a, a global forum. It's to move away from subsidizing fossil fuel industry and subsidizing perhaps those natural um, you know, options that you just mentioned. Um, and that will be an interesting thing perhaps to do, that to move the funds from, from one, the subsidies from one side to the, to the natural systems. Um, because the fossil fuel industry is subsidized, and, you know. So um, perhaps that is what, what we should try to push for. So, um, could, you, could you clarify? Thank you. Could you clarify how the fossil fuel industry is subsidised? Because that's really interesting. Um, well, I, 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 I'm not 
you know, myself are sort of in, in the finance sort of sector myself, but um, we know that governments, um, well, the, 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 the global industry, this global industry, what they do at the end of the day, it's, it's about lobbying, lobbying governments. And, um, and the, the, the governments, uh, what, what, what they do at the end of the day is they put subsidies to the global industries that are going to keep producing fossil fuels. How, how exactly they do it, I, I'm not in the sort of finance industry myself, so perhaps we need to, you know, find someone in the, a panel that could answer specifically that question, to be honest, you know. Yeah, I mean, that's in, I mean, it's very interesting because the fact is that we got ourselves into this mess through, fun, through economic development and through innovation and, and the pursuit of profit. And in the end, it's almost certainly going to be innovation and the pursuit of profit that gets us out of it in, in the longer term. And you're, you're absolutely right. A lot of this is about economics and the way in which money is... Hello, David. Asmarani wanted to ask a question. Right. Oh, or maybe uh, some, maybe someone else has a, that, a bit more of that answer, David, um, in in the audience. Maybe if someone comes from the finance industry, something you know. Hello, everyone. Uh, I have a question. As we know, the plastic problem, uh, the plastic problem was is growing, uh, become global problem, and what we know. Uh, plastic waste does not be regretted, uh, but it becomes microplastic. Uh, rather, it breaks down, uh, fragment by wind, waves, and sunlight into ever smaller. That's what we call uh, microplastic. So my question is, uh, how how uh, do we solve the microplastic that is already in the ocean? Uh, Thank you. <laughs> that, that's a, a hugely important question um, and and very very um, difficult to answer at this stage. Um, microplastics and then there are this the tiny ones, the nanoplastics, um, and there are some engineers that are trying to develop um, some devices or some type of you know. Um, devices to try to uh, deal with that, but at the end of the day, um, it comes back to to hopefully we will be able to stop producing plastic. That 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 we need to tackle the root problem of of that. Um, so with microplastics, um, it's it's very difficult to think that we're going to get rid of them anytime soon. It's, it's a tragedy because it's affecting lots of uh, ecosystems, biodiversity, um, and now there are certain studies that they are suggesting that are starting affecting, um, you know, the migration patterns of, of whales um, and, and, and other sort of, um, you know, natural systems in, in, in the oceans. Um, so I would say that I don't think anyone has a definite answer for that, but um, but it's but scientists, particularly engineers, are trying to develop forms of doing it, you know, ways of doing it. I, I know one person, which is part of our committee, for example, who is is a nautical engineer, and he's developing um, um, you know this uh, what is called the CVAX, and the is, and the idea is to put it in the, a solar powered device start sort of cleaning the oceans but it's a difficult thing it's very very difficult um you know there the are efforts two, mm, sorry. sorry there were two questions actually i looked at one from cheryl salmon and the other one was from Braden. david can you ask Braden and uh, cheryl to ask their questions Braden, you, you had a question which is i'm not sure that we know the answer to those questions but i'd be very interesting if you could explain a bit more what lies behind it which is a, the, explain the what raised what led you to raise the question which is about the economic incentives uh, that drive plastic levels yeah to me it seems like we talk about root causes and it seems to me like the economic 
incentives behind this is arguably the root cause. So my question was, does the UN discuss alternatives to the economic incentives that drive grotesque levels of plastic uh, production, e.g. championing donut economies and alternatives to GDP as a measure of of a nation's success? I'm not an expert in either of those two things, uh, alternatives to GDP or donut economies, but they're the kind of ideas you hear people throwing around. And I'm wondering if that dialogue has reached the UN. Yeah. I, would, I would like to share something uh, which Braden reminded me of. Um, his question reminded me of the slavery. When the slavery was abolished, the slavers had to be compensated hugely. Otherwise, they wouldn't have actually abolished slavery. So it's almost a similar situation I can see here. I think that yes. it would be a very good idea for us to have a discussion about uh, the impact of finance on the climate and the impact of climate on the yeah, climate. Yeah. It, it's, a very, it's a very important area and it's an area where it's, it's not only about um, <clears throat> incentivizing uh, businesses. I mean, one, one area is about disincentivizing businesses yeah. to cause damage. Uh, another is about incentivizing businesses to innovate and and get us out of this kind of mess and to establish there's a profit in in that direction. Absolutely, absolutely. I think also to make a a kind of, you know, uh, a case for green economy, which will be better than what they are doing at the moment. And that can, that can, that has already started. That has, I have seen some arguments about in favor of green economy, which will be far better and sustainable than what's happening at the moment. Yes. Can I just address, you know, Braden's um, question? I, I think <clears throat> I think what's going to happen at the end of the day, one of the key issues that the United Nations has actually um, locked in, shall we put it that way, the global governments, and it's through the Paris Agreement in 2015. Now, that document, I believe that document is going to be one of the most important documents that is going to be recorded in human history, especially with regards to climate change. And the reason is this, because that is a binding agreement. It's not just an agreement, a loose agreement. It's a binding uh, agreement by global governments, and they must commit every five years, or year by year, but every five years at least, they must commit with what is called the NDCs, the national um, something contribution, I can't remember the, uh, the D, what it stands for. But, um, but, but the, the, the crucial thing about that, it's that by international, they're bound by international law to re- reduce the carbon emissions at le- and report back to the United Nations every five years. Now with that, what I think is going to happen, because that is enforceable, and that's the reason why, for example, Donald Trump, wanted to pull out of the Paris Agreement because it is a, a binding document, it's a binding agreement. So, so, and he wanted the US at the time out for, for profit basically. And, and, and because it was, he was, uh, this is where geopolitics come into place because he wanted to get, get into that trade war with China. That was, that was the, the, the whole point of, of him pulling out. Thankfully now, President Biden is it's, it's coming back in because that will mean that the largest economy in the world and the largest polluter in terms of climate change in the world, it's going to be submitted to this Biden agreement. And what I think is going to happen in the end, that is going to force the whole world into change, exactly what you mentioned, move away from GDP economics to a more sustainable economics. The United Nations, in our case, UNA Climate and Oceans, we are putting at the heart what is called the SDGs donut. And what we put at the center is the planetary boundaries model. In other words, we put a, a, an ecological ceiling there. And, 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 and when there are aspects that go in overshoot, for example, like climate change, then that is what we raise the alarm, the, the, the alarm and say, actually, we need to, rest, we need to take back from that, you know, and those kind of things. With ocean acidification, for example, we are still not in complete overshoot. So that's, but we are sort of reaching the edge of the planetary boundaries. But that, I think, the Paris Agreement, it's crucial 
for global governance and if it's if it's going to be uh, for, for, for this global global problem thank you thank you that, that, that picks up I think, I think this is something we'll, we'll definitely come back to later in, in, in another session it's a really important issue we'll also pick up the question of the, the, the in, in a while you had a question that was given <coughs> time ago about uh, the enforcement of international agreements. Just before we go to that, it's actually quite an interesting thing. Ch Cheryl Salmon has raised the question about biodegradable plastic bags. I'd like to I'd invite her to say something. And then after her, just like Vanessa Gomez, because she's also appears to know a little bit more about that and has, a, has, has another point to make. So Ch Cheryl, could, could, could you? Uh, yes, thank you. Um, I feel quite strongly, I don't know why it's taken so long, that, uh, and I know that there are issues with biodegradable bags, but they've been widely available in all the supermarkets in, French, in France for at least 10 years, and just latterly, a couple of other supermarkets have started doing the same. I'm talking about the things that you have to stick your mushrooms in, you know, when you're choosing them in the vegetable sections. And I, in my personal opinion, I think we've got young people now who are becoming very, very aware of this and very passionate about it. And we need to encourage and maintain it like our young speaker that we had before mm. and, and put pressure on governments to say, make people pay if they're going to pollute. If, if they're not reducing their impact on the environment, tax them until they do. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It may not go down well with Boris Johnson, this idea, but, you know, <laughs> what does anybody think? <laughs> Vanessa, you, you had a comment about that biodegradable. Yes, I saw that, yeah. Yes. Yes, I've, I've, I don't know anything about them. All yes, I, I know I, is that, that they have had these slightly odd feeling bags for a while, that are apparently biodegradable, but I don't know what their overall impact on the environment is. Maybe the answer is not here now. Yes. No, I, 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 pers I personally agree with that we definitely need to move away from the, oh. um, you know, the plastics, plastic bags, you know, to these <coughs> biodegradable. Um, and, and, and yes, if, if we need, as, as, well, as it happened with the plastic, the, the, the usual plastic bags, I mean, a few years ago, the 5p in the case of the United Kingdom, the 5p mm. charge, it's a, it's a tax basically, mm. and that and that changed behaviour. So you're you're right, Cheryl. Mm. Actually, that if you notice, if we all notice, it Money changed behaviour. It's the same thing in France, of course. Mm. Same thing in France where they introduced that. That that's a tax. It mm. is a tax. You know. So um, yeah. It's more. It's more. <laughs> it, 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 you know, has an effect. Yeah. That can affect behaviour. It's, it's, it's quite that. There's a, it's an important point about money does affect people's behaviour. Yeah. Yeah. We had a query, a question from uh, Isaac Beaver, who lives in Luton, about what can what can be done uh, locally. It actually matches a question that we got from a Hindu temple, who said, "What can we do individually and collectively yeah. in Luton to, to deal with?" So, I, Ivan, um, Isaac, could you? Um, spell out, ask your question, please. <coughs> is, is, is Isaac? Is Isaac here? Isaac still here? If if not, then what I'll do, I'll go on to a, a, a question that was that was put to us by somebody who wasn't able to, to be here, and, and, and that is um, Muslim Hussein who is a, a barrister and a community activist from, from Luton. And he, he made a point which, which sort of goes back to what, what you, Gonzalo, was saying about the uh, Paris Accord. And he, he says that we've seen the Year Summit, the Kyoto Protocol, the Paris Climate Agreement, etc. Many promises by the international community about protecting the climate. We can't hear you, David. Hello? Well, it's, uh, it's frozen. Yeah, frozen. Yeah, we can hear you now. He, he points out that the, um, in, in 2010, that the Green Climate Fund was set up in Cancun, which was supposed to create $100 billion of development money for rich, pay, rich countries would pay to less developed countries to prevent climate cha change challenges. Now, he says, until now, not more than 15% has been raised. 
I actually have a, having looked it up, I have a feeling he's being a bit generous towards this actually. And yeah. As far as I can see that the target was to raise a uh, hundred billion dollars by, by 2010, 2020, over 10 years. And by 2020, they would actually managed 10% uh, of that uh, yes. billion dollars. And so th there's, his question then is if, if, the, if the wealthier countries are not really taking any of this seriously uh, and they make commitments, then how can the, the poorer countries make sure they get their, their fair share? And it strikes me that this is, this actually links up with something else that is very common. When you get uh, disasters, you get uh, cyclones and hurricanes and floods, earthquakes, etc. <coughs> everybody rushes forward and they pledge vast amounts of money to uh, help with all of this. But then, if you go back a year later, you find that having pledged all this money, many of the countries don't actually give it. So they get, they get, the, they get the credit for having said that they're going to <coughs> do this work. Uh, in the end, um, they, 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 they get away with not providing it. And I think that I think there is, a, there is a problem in the sense that the countries are independent sovereign states. It's very difficult to force people to do things, force a country to do something if they don't want to. But it, it does go back to the question you were raising about the, uh, about the Paris Accord and to what extent this will really be binding. Yeah, yeah. Yes, I mean, that, that is an, um, a very important um, issue. It's, it, it, is a, it's a, it is an issue. And it comes under what is climate justice. Precisely because um, it's the, we have to remember that it's, it's really quite recently, the damage to the environment, the damage to the global climate, it's not long standing thing really. It's from the industrial revolution onwards. So it's man-made. Therefore, the industrialized countries bear more responsibility because the industrialized countries historically are those who polluted more, those who use more fossil fuels uh, and so on. And, and the consequences of that, of droughts in certain parts of Africa and Asia, um, rising sea levels uh, because of the melting ice caps in, in the poles in Antarctica, and, uh, it's coastal communities, poorer, con po you know, <laughs> coastal communities in poorer countries. So, so why the, you know, while the uh, industrialized countries keep their lifestyle, then the poorer suffer the consequences of that lifestyle. And that is climate just justice. And that is something that, yes, we need, uh, we need to put pressure, shall we put it that way, on our governments to honor those commitments, mm. honor those commitments. And that is, it's, it's, a, it's exactly that. It's justice still <clears throat> not being done. And I would like to add to that by saying that the United Nations can actually name and shame those countries who are not doing that. Yeah. Well, while we're thinking of enforcement, is, is Emily uh, Malkin here? Is Emily Malkin is um, working with private members, with MPs in, in Britain. Yeah. With a crime private that, that, bill yeah. to actually try and do something about that. And, and this yeah. would permit the government if it goes through. Yeah. Is Emily yeah. here? Hi, yes, I'm here. Great. Hi, Emily. Hi. Hi, Emily. Hi. Thank Hi. you so much for having me, everybody, and thank you, Nazia, for inviting me to talk. Um, I won't take up too much of your time because I know we're running close to the end. Um, but my reason for being here is just to introduce you and hopefully ask for your support for our um, new Climate and Ecological Emergency Bill. Uh, so this is a private members bill that's been tabled by Caroline Lucas and 11 cross-party MPs in September last year. Brilliant. Brilliant. Great, yeah, and um, some of you may have heard of it, I hope. Um, but it uh, basically sets out the principles and the frameworks to ensure that we actually meet our Paris Agreement targets um, and stay below 1.5 degrees and 
uh, contribute our fair share to doing so. But not only does it um, cover climate targets, it also covers ecological protections and restorations, which I hope will be quite important for the audience on this call. Um, it's quite different from other bills before, whereas we want it to enshrine in law um, these targets, so they're not uh, negotiable and you can't retract from them, as we've discussed, and also that there's some strict time frames um, in there as well. It's been written by scientists, ecologists, economic, uh, economists, uh, deliberative democracy experts, um, so it is based on best science. Um, some of the examples are Tim Jackson and uh, Kevin Anderson. Um, and it's also supported currently by 96 MPs. And I think two of them include Mohammed Yassin, who's the Bedford MP, and Davy, Daisy Cooper, who's the St Albans MP. Um, so you're doing quite well from your area. Um, it's also supported by 35 businesses and organizations um, such as The Body Shop, Ecotricity and Greenpeace UK. But we are trying to build that continually. Um, and we also welcome individual support um, hugely. Um, so if you can support, I will um, share the link at the end. Um, but that's all very important in building a campaign around it and building momentum, especially as we're working towards COP26 in Glasgow. Um, one other important thing that you should know about the bill is that it includes um, what we call a citizens assembly. So once the bill is passed, the government is required to commission and collaborate with uh, a, an assembly of citizens, uh, which is a representative selection of the UK population. Um, and these will be guided by a um, <clears throat> independent body of experts, which could include the Committee, on Clim uh, Committee for Climate Change, um, as well as others. Um, and this uh, assembly will uh, basically discuss and recommend to the government um, what the citizens of the UK believe deem necessary um, to be done. If there is a 66% consensus from that citizens assembly, then the government must consider it, but ultimately the government will have to sign off everything through parliament. Um, I hope it's evident that the need for this is um, we need more citizen participation and we also need full representation uh, within uh, our decision making. And there have been successful um, instances of this in other countries such as in Ireland with the abortion uh, issue with, in Australia and in Belgium. Um, and I thought I would just very quickly outline some of the uh, ecolog uh, ocean ecology um, parts of the bill as that might interest the audience here. Um, so the bill says the strategy drafted will have to set out steps to actively restore and enhance natural climate solutions, which would include carbon sinks, um, which is uh, the ocean is one of as Gonzalo mentioned earlier. Um, it would minimize adverse effects of domestic consumption and production uh, from the on the United Kingdom ecosystems, but also on ecosystems abroad and in our supply chains. And uh, mentioning supply chains, we would have to um, assess and take responsibility for the impacts of imports and export activities and their effect on our ecological systems, um, as well as um, obviously pollution and waste being big issues uh, in that. Um, so that's a very, very brief overview. Uh, we do have one of the co-authors of the bill on the call if you want to ask any more in-depth questions. Um, but I will, if you're already sold, I'm going to share the link that you can sign up as an individual to support us. And you can also have a look at our website. Um, but if uh, you represent an organization or a business that would also be interested in supporting us at that um, more of that level, then please do email me and I will put my email in the link uh, in the chat. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Putting the link in is a really good idea. And I suggest that for those of us who are in the United Kingdom, that, that one action we can take away from this is just to make sure that our own MPs are among the 96. And, and if they're not, to perhaps uh, ask them why not. <laughs> I can say only one thing to Emily, that Emily, you got our support from the UNA Luton, and we will be with you in your campaign. Yes. Yes, I, I, I would like to ask something. I mean, uh, yes, I, I, I definitely think this, the, the, that is exactly one of the things that we should be supporting if we are, you know, climate activists or environmentalists in terms at, at government level. Because at the end of the day, we as citizens, one of the ways we have to push our governments is through our local MPs. And um, yes, actually, Carolyn Lucas was my MP when I was based in Brighton, so I know her personally. And so, <laughs> you know, she's, she's fantastic. And, and, um, and I would say that um, it's, it's, it's definitely something that we, we need to take very seriously that, that in order to, to uh, you know, change something you know, at government levels, it's our MPs that 
it's that that balance in democracy. It's through parliament to put to uh, make the government accountable. Uh, but but we have to pr put pressure on or our MPs for them to do it. That's the thing. Thank you. I, I agree. This, go, this goes back very much to, to Moazim's uh, question, which is, which is the, the way to ensure that the governments uh, adhere to commitments they've made is pressure from, ins from inside the, their own countries. Um, that, that's, that's the way forward on that. There's, there was actually a further question that um, Moazim asked which was specifically about Bangladesh. And uh, I've noticed that there have been a few people who have also been talking about, there have been some exchanges about what's happening in the uh, Shundarban areas in India and, and Bangladesh. And as we know, uh, Bangladesh is one of the countries which is a frontline state in terms of uh, the ocean, uh, levels of the ocean. And he said, uh, Muslim has said that a, a predict if the, if the sea levels rise between uh, up to about 2.3 feet as, as the glaciers melt, a, a huge coastal area like that will have, will lose a massive amount of land, and that, that that will have several effects. People will have people will be displaced, and they'll have to move on, and that there will be a rise in salinity in, in the soil, which will damage ag agriculture. And uh, he's saying, what what can a country like Bangladesh do to tackle this? I think this also applies. We've had uh, there are people here from uh, the Philippines and Indonesia and India. And I think mm -hmm. all, these are all areas where these are all countries which have low-lying areas where the, the rise in the level of ocean is, is very significant. Yeah. Um, yes. I obviously I don't know the specific uh, area of, of, of Bangladesh that, that this person is talking about. But globally, I mean, generally speaking, one of the important things is it's a question of global governance. Mm. And again, I think the um, United Nations plays a crucial role in here because uh, let's say uh, one of us, if I was the, um, the environment minister in, in Bangladesh and we have this issue, this real problem with the communities there, I would make a, a priority, for example, to attend and, and to um, uh, the events like uh, Co-op 26, because Co-op 26 and, and these events, it's, it's all about climate action. You know, it's all about climate action and, and holding the, 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 um, the governments accountable. Now, obviously it's, it's, it's a big thing in terms of, of what, and, and also countries like Bangladesh, I would suggest that should be forming coalitions with countries, for example, uh, smaller state countries um, of the Commonwealth countries, for example, mm -hmm. this, they face the same problem and they should be forming coalitions between countries and going as a block to these conferences where they have, they will have political power, you know, and um, I mean, th those are the kind of things I can think of, you know, that, um, that, how, you know, what kind of actions they could take at that kind of political level and and with help of the United Nations in my in my view you know there's actually an interesting uh, comment here uh, Arjun and Elia Raja is talking about mangrove conservation in Tamil Nadu in India yeah. um, it would be very interesting Arjun and if, if you could say a little bit more about that because this obviously relates to to, Ma to Masim's question Yes, I mean, um, yes, ma mangrove conservation, it's, it's another um, interesting, in, it's, it's also sort of tropical uh, areas, you know. Um, and again, um, although I'm not a specialist in that, in mangroves as such, but um, one of the things that I would like to see again is not only conservation, but also rewilding in those, in those kind of contexts. Uh, because it's, it's only by recovering the natural environments that, are, that ultimately we will be um, recovering, um, you know, those specific um, um, ecosystems that um, they will have, as well, again, they will have something important to add to the global climate, the global balance in that sense, if that makes sense, what I wouldn't, you know. But, um, yeah. Arjun, are you able to uh, 
add anything to that to give, to give it a bit of context, can't you? Mm -hmm. I think I should actually add two things about Bangladesh because Sundarban is an area which um, has been um, a, a focus for the government and also uh, neighboring countries for a long time. Uh, and I think reforestation of Sundarban area and also the uh, restoration of mangroves will be an essential project uh, which obviously is being looked at at the moment, but not really as much with as much uh, energy as it needs. Um, that will be one of the things Fatiha also mentioned Sundarban area, which is an important thing for Bangladesh for climate change uh, or to, mm. to address climate change. The other one is the uh, electrification of the rural Bangladesh areas because rural Bangladesh uh, hasn't got or at least 30% of rural Bangladesh hasn't got electrification mm. because of the landscape being full of rivers. It's very difficult to take cables uh, to the villages. Yeah. And as a result, what they do, they actually use kerosene lamps at night, which creates uh, a health hazard for families there. And uh, WHO was looking at the health of Bangladeshi village people because of that consumption of uh, terrible kerosene oil lamps, which creates uh, uh, lungs diseases and all kinds of diseases for Bangladeshi village people. And that uh, thing is being looked at very seriously in Bangladesh at the moment, because you know the solar powered uh, system that is now being taken to various villages, which is uh, an essential alternative to kerosene oils as it were, to restore health, to provide health, of the uh, villages. And I'm very pleased that that is happening. But what it needs is far more investment from somewhere, from some rich countries or from the United Nations itself so that it can become a viable project. Um, and as I said, 30% is still left out and 30% of rural Bangladesh is a lot. Mm. Natsia, can I add something? Because uh, um, in the chat there, Anthony mentioned something quite interesting there. Mm -hmm. Anthony Valian, uh, about Aruja, Aru, Aru, I have, I had mangroves held back the tsunami in some areas in, 20, in 2004. So very useful as a natural barrier. Yes, that, that's, that's an interest, very interesting point. If you, if you remember the big tsunami in 2004, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, because mangroves, as uh, the same thing with coral reefs, mm -hmm. coral reefs are, are, are natural barriers for big tsunamis. And that's the other thing, the other protection that that mangroves and and um, mangroves and um, and coral reefs provide for uh, for coastal communities. So there are other, you know, it's not only about pollution or, or but it's mm. also physical protection. So yeah, those yeah. are the kind of things that nature provides mm. for us, you know. Um, so we can't we can't afford to lose those mm. natural environments. Absolutely, and the health protection is very important because the, this climate deterioration has affected health across the world in poorer, poorer countries. And yeah. that is being looked at by WHO quite seriously at the moment. And I hope there will be some sort of outcomes uh, of these anxieties that people are feeling at the moment. Yeah. There's one um, point that, that Margarita Morton has made, which is to, uh, she's suggesting we should lobby MPs uh, to support the environment bill, which was debated in Parliament last week, and most of the amendments were voted down by almost all of the Conservative MPs. So that's another issue that I think pe people should be aware of. Mm. We have now gone you know, about a quarter of an hour beyond what we were supposed to. We've had a very interesting discussion. There's a particular point that, on a, on a positive note, because we've, we've, there's been a lot of, it, it's not a very, optimistic subject on the whole. But on a positive note, the, the talk, discussion about mangrove reminded me that yesterday the uh, Dutch court made uh, the Shell Oil Company uh, responsible for clearing up the mess that its subsidiary has made in the mangrove swamps of the Niger Delta, where they have completely destroyed the whole ecosystem there. And I think this is the first time that a company, uh, a, a company has been made responsible for the climatic or the 
the, the damage done by one of its subsidiaries, and, and they'll now have to clear up the Niger Delta Delta, Delta which, which I think is positive. Yeah. David, you haven't invited Diana Pritchard yet. Diana Pritchard is not here. Well, she's not she here. She wasn't able to come. Um, we could... You could read out her question. I'll read, I'll read out her statement. She said that she, I would like to make a brief observation that over the decades it has been proved that knowledge about climate chaos and related issues, such as ocean acidification and plastic pollution, both of which are a product of carbon fuel consumer economies, is not in itself a motivator for public engagement, nor for changes in behaviour, nor to increase public demands to government and representatives for policy change. What, with regard to the integrity of our oceans, do the speakers consider the most effective way to engage young people and students in caring about oceans? And what changes would they like to see take place? And she makes a point, this is particularly interesting in, in Bedfordshire, where Wilton is, which, which is landlocked and, and far away from the sea. Uh -huh. Okay, that, that's, that's interesting. Right, this is, the, we need to consider one thing. <clears throat> If let's take the uh, the um, the example uh, that perhaps this is the final example, Luton, which is inland, and you might think, or we might think, that there is no connection whatsoever. What what is connection with the oceans? And I can tell you, there's there is there there are very strong connections. The first one is through your sewage system. Inevitably what you put down the drainage there is going to end up in the oceans. So your connection with the, with the, uh, with the ocean, in the one hand, is through your sewage system. And, and, um, and so, so you, there are things that, you, you know, all of us, we need to avoid. Put chemicals, for example, you know, through, down the, um, the sewage system and uh, so through the pipes, because inevitably it's going to end up. Now in Luton, for example, you also have what's a river, is a river Lee, I believe it is. Yeah. Am I right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Rivers, you see, they're also, uh, somehow they're going to be connected at the end of the day with the oceans. Yeah. That river is going to be connected. So you have a connection. And if that river is polluted, for example, with microplastics or other plastics, then that is going to create it, it, that is going to end up in the oceans at the end of the day. So I would say, for example, if this is a, a local university with students, I would organize local campaigns, mm -hmm. you know, like, like the, the ones that, uh, you know, um, we, we, you know, uh, people organizing the, the, the beach cleans, for example, I would organize a loot on the river cleans for it, you know, and those mm -hmm. kind of things that, um, that in the end, thinking that that is going to have a connection not only with your local community but also with the global the global environment at the end of the day so yes there are things that that luton um and again you know it's not isolated we're all part of this we're, we're part of the problem but we're all part of the solution at the same time we all have to you know um pull together here um and um so so yes i i would suggest that you know um Organize local campaigns, you know, with taking into account the river, the local woods, you know, um, campaigning with young people is fantastic because they always engage, you know, they're full of energy. Um, and you put them, you know, that energy into, into a positive force. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I would add to that because in Luton, Luton Borough Council is actually very seriously looking at how to become carbon neutral and they have taken it up as an emergency and they're saying that their target is to be carbon neutral in 2040, uh, uh, 10 years before the government of this country uh, has set a target because government target of this country is 2050 but Luton Borough Council's target is 2040 so it is quite yeah. progressive in its ambition but yes. I don't know whether that will be fulfilled. Mm -hmm. But what it has done, let me tell you, it has actually set up a team within the council. And there, there are officers who are looking at it and they have an action plan. They have a proper report written up about the carbon uh, uh, situation in Luton. Mm -hmm. 
and climate change situation. And they have set up a board, an advisory board, whose responsibility now would be to have a proper community engagement. Because without community engagement, we people in Luton wouldn't know what to do personally, individually. And there was a question actually, as uh, a, an individual, what can we do in Luton? Mm -hmm. So we can, we will have to do a lot of things, but normal advice, as you see, if you Google search, what car do you drive, change your car and turn it into an electric car or something or something or the other, or have you insulated your house? Have you looked after your garden better? for biodiversity. Those are simple things that we learn. But I think if there is a sustainable engagement with the community uh, by Luton Borough Council, it will be systematically uh, looked at and we will progress systematically towards the yeah. target that they have yeah. set. So yeah. I wanted to reassure the people who are from Luton that if their target is not acted upon through various actions, through community engagement, I will be with you to campaign so that the local authority looks at it seriously. And we have friends in the Borough Council as well who will be supporting us. Oh. Brilliant. Just to follow up on action, uh, Emily, you mentioned that one of the authors of the CE bills is, is here. Um, perhaps that person could uh, say a few words. Hello, um, I'm Nessie. I actually am, I really coordinated because really the actual authors were the scientists. But um, yeah, one of the things I can say is storytelling. And um, we do have, which is probably more relevant, a global aspect of the bill. We're actually taking the principles of the bill and, in con and contacting European countries and we have a contact in New York. We're looking at the very rich countries lobbying their delegation for COP26 to push for much more ambitious nationally determined contributions, which is yeah. the plans given at COP26 to meet the Paris Agreement of one, staying below 1.5, along with ecological targets of a reversal of ecological restoration in the world by 2030, which mm. the leaders pledged, including our own leaders, have pledged, uh, I think it was in December, so there, please do uh, have a look at the CE Bill website and do contact us if you're interested in a global view of what you can do to lobby those COP delegations and also the COP 15, which is happening in, um, is it June or May, um, in Kuming. So please do get in contact if you want some ideas. But we're also hoping to do some filming of people from the Global South telling their stories and saying, yeah. if the rich countries actually met their full responsibilities, this is the difference it would make to our lives. And really it's the Global South who should be, lead, show, you know, we need to, they, they can show us the way because they've lived within their planetary boundaries. That's all I have to say, thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Interesting, very interesting. Uh, and Andrea Kennedy has, has, has put a sort of comment around, which I think I'll just throw it open. People may may know about it, may have an answer. She says, "I'm really interested any in any virtual work experience in this area. Are there any ways to get involved? Any avenues you may suggest?" Um, now, so I'm just throwing that open. One person has suggested. Uh, uh, Jun Yu has suggested. Uh, re earthable the international youth climate organization so that's something i will try and we'll try and put that onto the website as well so that we can get the link so that uh, people can find it again are there any looks like we've come more or less to the end of the main questions we've gone it's actually gone about half an hour after our first David, yeah. David, uh, I've got a suggestion, uh, David and Nancy. Maybe, um, I think, um, see, we, we, we're talking now about sort of practical solutions. Yeah. What I would like to see, and, and we, we, this evening, here we've got, we had such an interesting international um, audience and, 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 and friends, shall we put it that way, you know, that we're all concerned about this, which is fantastic. Um, what I would like to see that perhaps we could organize um, an international workshop mm -hmm. 
where we talk about zones. Let's yeah. say we talk about, okay, here, Europe, the Americas, then Africa, Asia. So we divide into four time zones yeah. and all of us internationally, we have a forum here. We can contribute to ideas. Okay, what's your problem in Bangladesh? How can we help you, you know? The rest of us. That will be very interesting, very dynamic, something you know, very as uh, democratic at the same uh, at the same time. I mean, I would be up for that. I mean, you know, we could uh, we could call again through the through event rights to another sort of a workshop of that nature if if people are interested, because uh, you see, we could all go, uh, you know, and 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 support that. Um, the um, that bill that that uh, Emily mentioned, for example, yeah, yeah. Uh, and find ways together. Well, how are we going to campaign about that? You know, um, um, but it's, it's it's that sense of togetherness. It's that sense of togetherness that Absolutely. you know the, the the people who are here from you know with us from from Pakistan, from India. How can we be with them? You yeah. know, Absolutely. I think that's a really good idea. And the, the, the great merit of Zoom is, is that we can actually connect with each other. And Precisely, it would be yeah. quite impossible if we were trying to. Uh, Add to, add to the problems by getting all over the world to meet each other. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. We have perhaps, perhaps we should we should we should uh, sort of organise. Um, this is you know I put on the table that a call you know a Zoom call for for campaigning. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean yeah. for campaigning, that, which leads us into what we want to how we want to finish off. It's about action. Just, just before we exactly. go into that, uh, just a couple of questions that came up. One was somebody suggested that we put the because this is being recorded, suggested that we put the recording onto YouTube, which hadn't occurred to me, but I think that's quite a good, that's a good idea. Um, somebody else wanted to say, would we put the David Attenborough video, we'll, we'll, we'll put the link to the David Attenborough video. Yeah, of course. Yeah. And somebody also asked Gonzalo whether you'd be willing to make your slides available. Uh, yeah, yes, indeed, yes. For, for private use, you know, or educational use only. Yes, I mean that, 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 that's something to um, think about. I think because uh, absolutely, absolutely, yeah. Okay, yeah. so um, I think probably we we have been actually reduced to forty-two now, out from eighty something. So that means half of the people have left already. So we have to think about um, sort of wrapping up. Um, would you like to say something, uh, Gonzalo, uh, when we are wrapping up? Because you are the main focus. Oh, well, I, I, <laughs> I wouldn't like to think of myself as the main focus, but I, you know. But anyway, the, 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 I think the uh, the way I would like to um, to end this is that first of all, yes, we are in a we've got a big problem here, a global problem. Absolutely. But on the other hand, I would like to end up with a call, call for action, mm. but, but for us to campaign together. That's what I, want, I would like to see, that yeah. we can form a global campaigning group here with all the wonderful people that we had here, you know, from Tierra del Fuego, from India, from Pakistan, from that, that girl, that fantastic girl from New York, uh, you know, um, she could be a world voice, you know, in all this, and, and, um, and form a, um, actually form a movement, a Absolutely. movement. You know what I mean? Yeah. That we can, you know, lobby MPs here or there, you know, or, or, or governments, and, and why not? Exactly. Uh, that is a way I would like to say, you know, that, yes, we have a problem, but let's dream together. Let's dream that we can make a difference. That is my point. I'm very glad that you are so hopeful, and that's why we are together. If we are not hopeful, exactly. we shouldn't be coming to any of this at all. What do you say, David? I think that's a really good idea. I, I, I think it's worth trying, trying to. We, there's no point in doing this and just stopping. So, so we we need to follow it up. Absolutely, action plan, and then yes, and, and we will, and we will. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> and then, there was a lovely, there was a lovely comment from somebody. Uh, of course, we have recorded it. I, I'll look at it later. Somebody said, "Patiha." Um, don't ever lose your fire. So you yeah. see <laughs> that little girl, what she said, she's absolutely fired up. And if we have that kind of 
fire in us, we'll get together and do something yeah, about it. We yeah. can make changes around. So, N Natsia, can can I can I just just briefly, you know, the story of that little girl that we all heard today. Yeah. She came. She found us on found on Eventbrite. Yeah. She found <laughs> and she sent me an email. She sent me an email. And then we, we organized with Natsi and David a Zoom call with her. When was that? Uh, was it yesterday or something like that, yeah, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah. That's right. And she was from New York. And, and we said, and, and she asked, can I speak at your event? She said that to us. Said, and then, of course you can. This is what we are, the United Nations Association. You know what I mean? So I think that is, this is what we need to do. This needs to be very democratic. It's your That's voice. Right. See, this is what we want. We want people to speak out, not to be silenced. This is exactly. real, the real, the real, real campaign is. That's what we need. Absolutely. And we need that transparency as well, because some people have all kinds of things they do, but they're not transparent enough for other people to pick up those things. So right. when we get together like that, it is a definite interaction that creates further action. And I, I hope, I'm very, very positive that uh, further action will come out of this. And we will get together, the three panelists here, David and uh, Gonzalo and myself, and produce something which we'll share with you so that you don't forget how enthusiastic we all were about it. So that some better action can follow and on a sustainable basis, we'll have more things coming out of it as Gonzalo was saying, a campaign, because a campaign can actually create changes. Mm, Definitely. Yeah. I have seen changes coming through campaign yeah. And David gave an example uh, how campaign can change things. Uh, and I always think about how uh, through campaigns and good work, slavery was abolished. 300, yeah. 400, 500 yeah. years of bad practice yeah. can go. Mm -hmm. So yeah. things are looking up and I'm sure things will happen. And in Bangladesh, it was mentioned several times. There are many other countries like that, frontline countries we can help them by giving them information as well and have a network with them like this. Mm -hmm. We can right. invite them. So, so another, very positive, <laughs> very, another very positive note, it just occurred to me that 2021 is actually quite a significant year. Yeah. Because from this year, the European Investment Bank will no longer uh, invest in fossil fuels. That's fantastic. That, that's the result of campaigning. Campaigning, yeah. That, that shows it's a significant point that money is not going in that direction. That's so fantastic. This is the last year that they will. Yeah. I, I, will, uh, I will warmly uh, thank all of you for staying up with us. And some people, it's midnight in some countries. So I can understand that <laughs> you are absolutely uh, want to go to bed as well. And thank you so much, our international guests, our local guests, and our national domestic guests. And it was fantastic. I think the interaction was very, very good. It was really good. And Gonzalo, I can't thank you enough. You have given so much today. And thank Funnily enough, those people who give quite a lot, people demand more and more from them. And I will demand a little more for, from you in the future as well. well it's, about, it's about cooperation and collaboration. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I know. And David, thank you so much for being absolutely a rock for all of these things that we absolutely. do. Absolutely. Yes. Excellent. So, Good guests, room. thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, midnight. Midnight. Uh, Arjun and I said midnight in India now. All oh. right. Okay. Time for oh, bed. Thank you so much, Gonzalo. It's good to meet you, Swida. Sleep well. Sleep well. Good night, everybody. <laughs>